Lawsome by Consult Webs. Breakthrough insights to build a thriving law firm with your host, Tanner Jones. Carol Shiro Greenwald is a very well known speaker and frequent contributor to many periodicals on topics related to strategic networking. Carol is a fellow of the College of Law Practice Management and active member of the Westchester County Bar Association, a member of the NYSBA Law Practice Management Committee, and a member of the ABA Law Practice Divisions. She's also past president of the New York Legal Marketing Association. Carol, it's abundantly clear that you stay busy in this industry. Thank you for making time to join the show today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Well, let's start with the definition and the impact of today's big topic, strategic networking. What is it and why is it important for law firms? Networking is, is what the name that we give for what's the most important part of marketing and building a business for any professional who is hired for themselves as well as for what their skill set is. And so it basically is a process where you go from shaking hands with a stranger through a series of meetings with them and getting to know them better and better until you end up as friends. That's as simple as that. And we all do it. We do it in our social life. We do it in work. But in work, it kind of gets a bad name and it sounds scary. Strategic networking is networking with intent. It's networking where it's based on your goals. You develop a plan. You figure out who you want to meet. And then you find out where they are and you go meet them. And so it's strategic because the whole thing is designed to help you meet your goals. Nobody has time to do networking 24 hours a day, not even me and I do networking for a living, but you have to fit it in. So if you're going to fit it in, you need to be strategic. And you said establishing or reaching goals for it, but, but, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming, and hopefully we can get to this, but I, I imagine goals are different from one attorney to the next. At the root of that, though, why is that why strategic networking is important for lawyers is is ultimately to achieve a, a, an established goal? How how would you speak to that concept? No, it's to meet goals through the strategy that you set. But networking is really important because if people don't know who you are and what you do, you won't get any business. A friend of mine is a an, a T and E lawyer and an introvert. He's actually my T and E lawyer. And he says he hates networking, but he's actually very good at it. And I said one day, well, why do you do it? And it's, it's in my book. And he said, I do it because if I didn't, people would think I was dead and I wouldn't have any business. <laughs> that's, what, that's one reason. It's the best way of building visibility, keeping visibility and expanding visibility. And if you don't have that, then you're not going to get new work. You're not going to be known. You're not going to have a reputation. You know, you have to build your own brand. And one of the big ways of doing that is through networking. Well, you, you mentioned a, a really interesting topic that I'd like to, to touch on, and that's the concept of networking, you know, networking on behalf of an extrovert or networking on behalf of an introvert. I've, I've heard this come up in the past, honestly, just to call it what it is, as an excuse, you know, that you know, I'm not made for networking. That's not really in line with my personality style. How would you address that concept between the two? Well, that's why I called my book Strategic Networking for Introverts, Extroverts, and Everyone in Between. I'm an introvert. What I used to say to my boss when I was director of marketing at Richard Eisner was I'm an extrovert from nine in the morning to six at night. But when I leave you, I go back to real life and I'm an introvert. But the difference between extrovert and introvert isn't what you do and where you go. It's where you get your energy. Extroverts get their energy from humans, from meeting and talking and being involved and doing all these things with people. Put them by themselves on a desert island for two hours and they'll go nuts. Introverts would love a desert island because what we do is we get our energy from being alone and thinking and putting ideas together and having time to just be and reflect. And then there's a continuum. So you go along the whole thing. You know, I spent 20 years in house and every day I was an extrovert. By the time I got off that train in the morning, I was an extrovert. By the time I got off the train at night, I was me. And it wasn't that difficult to do. Introverts are the best networkers. And the reason is because an introvert does not want to go from person to person going, hi, Tanner, how are you? It's so good to see you. Kiss, kiss. You know, let me just go over and talk to Charlie over there. Hi, Charlie, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. 
You know, are you still having a good time with your little daughter? Oh, that's great. On to Susie. Okay, that's an extrovert. They don't stay very long. They flit in, they flit out. They make a very quick impression. An introvert's not going to do that. An introvert's going to walk up, introduce themselves, and stay for a discussion. So they have a better chance of getting to know the two or three people they talk to than the extrovert who says hello to 50 people. That's so true. And I know you're a, you're a big proponent of, of being true to yourself, of being true to your own personality and being authentic, which is critically important, especially for networking and being able to, to connect with individuals. But do you have any tips for listeners, maybe on both sides, you know, tips for extroverts or tips for introverts as well with respect to being more memorable in the effort of networking? Yeah, I think the basic thing for both of them is that if you're doing strategic networking, you don't go to an event and just pop in. You do a little bit of research ahead of time about the purpose of it, the reason they're having it. If you're a member of a group and it's a group meeting, you look up what a couple of you people who will be there are doing these days. You make what we call an agenda where you think about questions you wanna ask specific people, things you wanna contribute that you want them to know about what you've been doing and how you'll measure success that day. Because one of the problems with networking as with personal marketing is people don't think they get anywhere because they don't have goals that are specific to the event. They just have big goals. So you want a goal for every single networking activity that you do so that you can see whether it worked and it helps you to fine tune it, et cetera. So for extroverts, what they have to do is remind themselves that they really want to get to know Charlie, Debbie, and Susie better. And so they're gonna send them a note before the meeting and say, are you gonna be there? I'm looking forward to catching up or I'm looking forward to finding out how you're um, doing your next uh, social media campaign whatever it is, and they'll get an answer back. If the answer comes back that I'm not going, then you send a response that says, I'll take good notes and let you know what we did because you wanna continue the conversation. And so you're gonna slow yourself down by talking with those three people. If you're an introvert, you're gonna do the same thing, but with a little different. You're gonna say, I would like to talk to these two people because this is what I need to know from them. This is how they can help me and I can help them. And so either way, so for an introvert, it's giving them the security of having a plan. These are the questions I want to ask. I've practiced them. This is what I can say because, you know, this is not Jeopardy. We don't want to go bing, 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 bing. That is really boring. I call that verbal ping pong. And that's the worst of all worlds for anybody. So you don't want to do that. But you you do want to be prepared. So for the introvert, I have what I want to say. I know who I want to talk to. So I have created a box. And in that box, I have put myself and I'm safe so I can do this. And what I always say is if it's um, an event that you will not be comfortable at, don't go. So I do not go to cocktail parties. Why? Number one, I'm five feet tall. And when everybody's standing around, I can't see anything. I'm looking at everybody's belt buckle. It's ridiculous. Second, I don't drink. So parties get really boring at cocktails when they're on their third and I'm on water. Fourth, I'm an introvert. I don't want to find 50 people I don't know in a room where I know three people. I'm uncomfortable. And if I'm uncomfortable, my body language is going to say so, and I'm not going to be successful. So I don't go. And all my friends laugh at me. They go, the great guru does not go to cocktail parties. And I go, no, I practice what I preach. I don't go. But you want to have a meeting of 20 people where I know 15 of them? I'll be there. Do you, you know, do you want to have a one-on-one? -on -one? Do you want to put together an event and have me help you do? I'll do all those things. But I won't go to a big cocktail party because I know it's not a place that I'm comfortable enough to be effective. And everybody has things like that. And they just need to acknowledge it and find an alternative. That's such great advice, you know, and, and that goes back to being who you are knowing your strengths, you know, know, knowing where you thrive and, and, and leveraging that. I think that's such a powerful piece of advice, but let's keep moving. Cause in, in your book, you state successful networkers help themselves by helping others. And obviously the legal profession, it's a, it's a hyper competitive industry. And so, you know, in an industry driven by competition, how's it possible to do well by first looking to do good for others? 
What have you personally learned or experienced in that respect? So let me start by saying two um, cliches. The first one is nobody likes to be sold to, but everybody likes to buy. The second one is an IBM ad. And it said, stop selling what you have, start selling what they need. So what are they both saying? They're saying it's about other people. And it is. Nobody wants to network with or be friends with the person who's the pushy one. What can you do for me today? What can you do for me tomorrow? What can you do? You know, how can you help me do this? How can you help me do that? They're going to last about three seconds and they're going to be out and everybody is going to start moving away from them. And you can see this in group meetings all the time. What people need to do is play it forward, as we say. You need to think about what is the other person saying they need and how can my resources, my skills, my talents, and my connections help them? And so the person says that, that they, they wanted to begin doing um, speaking engagements. Well, I do a lot of speaking engagements and I can help them by putting them in touch with people that hire me to do speaking engagements. So I can help them. Are they gonna help me? Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't, but they may. And um, in any case, I build a reputation as a giver rather than a getter. So what we say in one of my networking groups is um, you give to get and what goes around comes around. And you know, that's really true. That's true from the playground on up. You know, look at the kid in the playground who sits by themselves and you'll see a conversational bully who only wants what he wants for himself. So same is true today. We all learn it in kindergarten. I should have written that book instead of the one I wrote. It's interesting to me. I, I've been in the, the business of helping law firms attract cases from the internet uh, for, for over 12 years now. And I've seen this evolution, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this as well to some degree, but this evolution of historically law firms have relied almost exclusively on referral business. Referral business and word of mouth marketing. You know, year after year, firms have have relied on that, and then we've seen the internet rise in marketing. and And to some degree, I've, you know, I've, I've personally experienced some lawyers see that as the the perceived silver bullet, and and they're kind of their their key to getting away from having to do the the hard work of referral and just stroke a check to their marketing provider. But obviously, that's not true. Um, but I am seeing less reliance, or at least less effort on maximizing referral business. And so it's underutilized, and I would argue severely underutilized by attorneys today, especially younger attorneys. Can you provide our audience with any tips for establishing or developing a referral network if they're looking to, to build this into their playbook? Yeah, a couple, I think. So the first thing is, is that everybody needs a good contacts list. And on that list, there'll be people who could refer to them, but they need to think about where do referrals come from. So for instance, if you're a divorce lawyer, you can get referrals from T&E attorneys, trust and estates attorneys, because they're likely to hear about a divorce. You might hear it from um, social workers or therapists if they're part of your network. So you want to build a network around the kind of people who can help you to meet your desired target client. And then you want to figure out how you can help them back. What is it they need that you can give them? Think about it the other way. You get a divorce client and they don't even realize they need to change their will. You, you get a client, you know, that's, they need T&E, they need real estate, they need a corporate lawyer. So all of these things can build together. So if you're in a firm, one of the things you can do is build your own referral network within the firm among people who are in your cohort or maybe the cohort above you. So even associates, they think they can't market. Of course they can market. And they can cross market best within their firm among people they see every day who are their peers. And then they take that out. So I'm a firm believer that it, effective marketing means joining groups. Why? Because we don't have enough time for one-on-one -on -one in this world. We really don't, really. So, but in groups, we can do a quasi one-on-one -on -one by preparing ahead of time. And then one or two in-depth one-on-ones may be in the month between meetings. So in those meetings, you listen to what people say and who they work with. And then if they're the kind of people that would be good clients for you, you get to know them and you 
teach them what you do. So how do you do that? You don't say, hi, I'm a real estate lawyer. Hey, that's the most boring thing. You know, that's, so what does the other person say back? Oh, that's nice. Your mother must be proud. I mean, what is there? You know, it, it's a conversation dead end. But what you can do is talk about how uh, you had a really interesting case the other day because you're a real estate lawyer and there was a question about the boundaries of the property. The people who were selling thought it was size X so the people who were buying thought it was size Y. And then they had this big thing and you had to go and bring in surveyors and all these kinds of people that you had never really worked with before. And it was very interesting to you and you're planning to learn more about surveying. And well, after that, you could ask me a thousand questions, Tanner, right? Because you got interested. And so you're going to remember that when somebody wants to know about finding a real estate lawyer. Now, if every time in a group you tell a different story, you build up a whole arsenal about what you know and what your capabilities are. And people are very confident referring you. And that's how you build a referral network. That's great. Yeah, e easy. I mean, you, you talk about it's, I, I believe easy in theory, but, but you're talking about a true blueprint here. And, and the networking doesn't start in the moment, in the face-to-face -face moment. As you said, it, it starts with doing due diligence, doing research, knowing who your audience is, who you're getting in front of. And, and honestly, I think that's the, the key differentiator, the ones who are truly successful. And we'll get into the concept of becoming a rainmaker here in a, a moment. But I believe that is what's ultimately differentiating, you know, the, the truly successful lawyers who have built a, a book of business through referrals versus the ones who have not. It's, it's the ones who are willing to do the homework, uh, just as you're suggesting. But I, I do want to I want to cover the other concept uh, beyond just verbal communication, because I think a lot of times we get lost in just thinking, what am I going to say? What am I going to ask? But body language is certainly another player in this conversation in terms of establishing and building relationships. How can how can we or, or lawyers in particular more effectively communicate face to face, even in online meetings with body language? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so I think that most people, and particularly people who are rational intellectual types like lawyers on the whole, don't ever think about their body language at all. But it's really important for two reasons. The first one is, is you have three seconds to make a first impression. That first impression is going to become the basis of the way the other human being thinks about you for the rest of your life. And if you want to change it, it's going to take seven attempts to change it that are you really work at it. So you better come in and be good. You know, the second one is, is that people lie, but bodies don't. So you want to present your body as the professional, in charge, competent, authentic, trustworthy, knowledgeable, all the things that people look for, because they never look for skill set, they assume it. Oh, you're a cravat and you're a corporate lawyer. Of course, you know how to do it. Are you nice? Because if you're not nice, I don't want you. Nice is what I need. So it's important that you do that. You need to, before you go into a meeting, before you go into a group, you need to take a deep breath, stand up tall like your mother told you, like you had a ruler on your back and a string in the middle of your head, and you were pulling yourself up like that, and put your shoulders back, put your shoulders down, walk straight ahead, with a purposeful kind of stride, a smile on your face, go up to whoever you're talking to, and in the old days, shake hands. Now what I do is I say, do you wanna shake your bum? <laughs> because we have no idea what people wanna do, and you don't, you don't wanna put them in an awkward position. But the second thing that putting your body together like that does is your brain takes its cues about what we're doing now from your body. So if you went to a meeting in person in your pajamas, your brain would be very confused because pajamas mean fun and work clothes mean work. But when you get dressed in the morning for work and women put on makeup, uh, men put on shoes, you <laughs> get yourself together and you go out, the brain says, oh yeah, we got to work today. Okay. She's going to want me to have answers. She's going to want me to pay attention. Okay, I'm really with it. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. And the executive decision-making part of your cortex says, okay, no rest till we get home. 
I'm doing this and I'm ready. So when you stand up and you say, I'm ready to talk to people, here I am, okay, then your brain goes, here I am, I'm here. Okay, we can do this. Hi, Charlie, how are you? It's so good to see you. You know, last time we talked, you were busy with a case that sounded like the case from hell. Did it ever resolve itself? Yes, it did, blah, 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 blah. We're on, we're off, we're talking, we're talking, telling stories about what we do. Now, that's not always easy to tell stories. So I always tell everybody in that prep time of theirs, think of the story ahead of time that you want to tell. Because when somebody says to you, so tell me how you do that. I don't know about you, Tanner, but I go, huh? How do I do that? Uh, 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 and I sound like an idiot. So I have to think ahead of time about a story about how I do that to remind myself that that's what they want to know anyway. People remember stories. Why? Because the world is moving really fast and we have all those toys that you are fabulous at teaching people how to use. The problem is, is that the brain is thousands of years old and has not caught up. And we need to understand that and we need to give it the cues that it needs. So online, almost the same thing is true. So you have to, so I'm not doing it, but here we go. You have to sit up straight. How do you do that? You keep your bottom against the back of the chair. It's impossible to slouch if you do that. Otherwise you're gonna go like that. You make sure that you're centered in the middle of your screen so that people see you. Now in real life, you get to move all the time. In Zoom like this, you don't. You don't get to move. And that's very unusual. So what you need to do is be a little more obvious in terms of laughing, smiling, nodding your head. You can't turn and look at a person because I can turn and look at you on my screen, but you don't know I'm looking at you because we're sitting in different places on our screen. So it, it does, you can't do that, but you can nod, smile, et cetera, but you don't want to move out of the screen and you don't want to do this and you don't want to do all of those other things that in a real meeting, no one would notice. In a real meeting, nobody sits still. Do you ever notice that? They don't. They get up, they turn to their neighbor, they play with their papers, whatever. In a Zoom meeting, every time you do something like that, it's exaggerated. Noises are exaggerated, movements are exaggerated. So you, you need to be aware of what you're doing more in terms of your body language. Also, I, you can't see enough because if I really wanted to see full, to know what you really think, I need to see your full body because the part of you that tells me the truth is your feet and I can't see your feet. But in real life, your feet go in the direction your body, your mind wants to move. So when you see people talking, if someone's got one foot facing the middle and one foot going out, you know they want to leave. You don't know where they want to go, but you know they're not happy where they are. I do. Love, I mean, you've hit on so many points there that, that stand out to me. I've, I've heard it been, be said that, you know, people, people make decisions based on emotion and then they, and they attempt to back it up with, with logic and reasoning. And, and, and it goes, I mean, just what we're talking about here with body language, you mentioned that first three seconds are critical. I, I suspect that most listeners are not consciously considering that and, and what impact that could make if they start to do that consistently. It's powerful. Another piece, too, is just just the, the benefit, the dual benefit of, you know, coming prepared, dressing, dressing prepared, dressing professional um, goes along right right with the body uh, or, or body language piece. And I know in, in high school football, it's been many years ago, our coach started to have us dress up very sharp on Fridays before game day. And, and he always stated it's, it's, it stayed with me even to this day. You, you look nice, you play nice. Um, and it's, it, it changes the mindset. It, it, it builds you up. It brings you up. And ultimately in doing that, you lift others up in that process. So hopefully listeners are able to take that away and, and start applying that immediately. Several things there, but we, we kind of started down the path of digital, you know, with respect to Zoom meetings or networking, speaking to individuals in a virtual world. In this digital era that we're living in, we know it 
might be easier for lawyers that were already networking just to continue doing that, continue networking and, and just kind of bridge the gap there online. But what about new lawyers who are starting from scratch and, you know, maybe trying to just look in different directions to see where to even begin? How can someone join a new community or gain visibility and build those new relationships with relevant contacts in their industry from the comfort of their own home. Any tips for listeners there? Well, the first thing they can do is think about what they want to join. So everybody who's a lawyer has a college and a graduate school alumni association. They can join them. They can find people that they knew in school. They can get their friends to join, et cetera. And it's very comfortable because you have school to talk about, you know, and going back and all those other things. They and new lawyers need to join their bar associations because they need knowledge. You come out of law school, you understand law as a concept, but you haven't really applied it, except you know, moot court practicing cases. So there's a lot more to law than that. So you can begin to learn it. Then you start looking at the kinds of clients that you have and you say, Well, where do people go who are like that? What do they read? What do they join? So you maybe they're um you're um, a litigator and you do um, product liability. So maybe you want to join the manufacturing association of your largest client. Why? Number one, because there won't be many lawyers there. You're going to be just the unicorn in the group, which is great. Number two, because you'll learn what they are talking about, what they care about, what they are interested in, and you'll be able to be relevant online. If you want to stand out, you need to be relevant. So I think in a way, um, online has helped people because you can put in your zip code or your title and ask for networking groups that come up and you'll get tons of them. And then from the from your seat, you can go to them and see if you like them, see if the people who are in them are interesting to you, see if they're people that you might want to get to know better. And you never have to leave your chair. Whereas once we start being in person, you're going to have to go to those meetings where you don't know somebody and sit in and see if you like the vibes from it. So I think it's easier. But the best place to start is the Bar Association and your alumni because you have camaraderie already and an understanding already of the context of those groups. I think this is such an interesting topic because uh, people often relate online networking with you know, a law firm having a strong digital presence or, or being incredibly active on social media and having a large following. But it seems like that that's where often where the, the misconception or the lies are coming in, because you're hitting on effective networking strategies and solutions that don't necessarily require a following of 100,000 people, just more intentionality of getting in involved in the right group. Now, certainly having a large following helps. Uh, but What's your take on that? Would, would you agree with that? I don't think that professionals like lawyers necessarily need a large following. Yes, I mean, I follow several futurists like Jordan Furlong because to me, he's just brilliant and I follow him. I follow um, Bruce, Bruce Ewan, who was Adam Smith online um, and they have great followings, but most of us aren't going to be Adam or you know Jordan. We're, we're going to be just regular people. So what we want to do online is we want to be sure that the connections we make are as relevant as if we were in person. So my pet peeve personally, and I don't know what you think because you're the guru in this, I'm not, is that there, you're on your, let's say we're on LinkedIn, we're on our homepage feed, right, from everybody. And then you see comments and the comments are, great article, Charlie, you know, oh, that's so interesting, Susie. And I'm like, would you not ever please do that? What you need to do if you want to answer is be, be relevant and be yourself. What you need to say is, I, I read the article. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. But I, as a real estate attorney, I don't agree with the part about um, climate change and wetlands. I've done this work in this area with my clients, and I think... So you need to add something substantive to the discussion. Just add a boy, add a girl is ridiculous. And it makes you look flighty, empty, lazy, um, quick, you know. And, and I have a, a friend who's a, a LinkedIn teacher, you know, that has the coach certification. And he says, don't use the emojis either. 
don't like and love and think that you've done something. If you want to do something, then answer it. Keep the make it a, a discussion. Keep it going. And I, and I think that that's true. Don't you? Too many people are just lazy and and flip through. That's right. It's it's a it's an interesting kind of flip that our society seems to be be having right now with respect to perceived value and quantity over quality. You know, and just going through and liking or, you know, celebrating with um, it's almost as if you're you're doing them. A fa you feel like you're doing them a favor by engaging with their posts, even if you haven't even spent a moment reading what they posted. That's that's such an interesting concept to really just come to come to reality on. It doesn't require a ton of individual interactions. It really requires more intentional and fewer interactions to be effective in this effort and what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, strategic. Yes, you answer the ones that are strategic. You answer the ones where you have something to add to the conversation because of what you know and what you do. And it, it's the same thing as if you were in person. You know, in person, as people go around the room, introduce themselves, tell stories, tell about trends and things, but we don't go, add a boy, add a girl, like it, love it. No. But online, we think that that's perfectly okay. I tell my clients, join groups where you can hear what your audience cares about and what your colleagues are talking about. And once a week, answer one post, but answer it intelligently. So I told this to one client of mine, she was an insurance defense lawyer. So you know what that means. They have 5,000 cases at a time. They're always in court. She said to me, I don't have time. I said, it's 15 minutes once a week. You have time. So she goes on, she goes online to this group. The, the woman asks for some information. My client writes back, um, get in touch with me offline. I have a lot of information about this because I've done many cases that involve this problem. Let's talk. Okay, that's not my favorite answer, but it's okay. The woman re reaches out to her and says, do you really? I'm the editor of Blah 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 magazine and I would like you to write an article on it. So she writes an article on it. The article comes to the attention of a person who's doing one of the main conferences in her field. The woman calls her up and says, you wrote that article. I thought it was terrific. Would you like to be on the panel? All from one thoughtful answer. Now, every time it doesn't work like that, you know, um, she was lucky, but was she lucky or did she pick well? I don't know. You know, it, it maybe both, maybe a little of both. And so suddenly she was in a magazine that she wanted to always be in. She was on a panel. She was asked back for many years. And isn't the dirty little secret of LinkedIn groups that most people join them and never participate. And there's always a core of 20 people who participate. So if you become one of those 20, you're building your referral network, you're building your visibility. Just make sure it's among the people that you want to know you're visible. What do you think? I mean, you've, you've been doing this for a long time, Carol. What do you think's holding lawyers back from, from taking this? I mean, we, we're talking like it's simple, right? Just a little bit of time every single week, do it consistently, give value, be intentional, and you're going to see results. What's holding lawyers back from doing this? Well, they work really hard. They tend to value the intellectual component of what they do and are not sure how to turn that into conversation. They, they may be closer to introverts on the scale than to extroverts. But also I think because there's all these boogeyman things. When you ask someone, even a good networker, as I did for my book, what do you dislike most about networking? They say, going to a party where I don't know anyone. Well, that's a human nature, right? We all feel that way. But most people equate networking with large parties, large conference sections, large drinks after the, the panels, and they get scared. But really, it's not that. It's one by one in small groups if you want it, in large groups if you like them. But it's just one by one, and you pick the venue. And I think it's an intellectual process. I think it's just like law. You pick what you want to do that you're good at, that you like, and that will help you, just like you do when you pick whether you want to be a real estate lawyer or a merger and acquisitions lawyer. I love that. And hopefully that gives our listeners the freedom to to run with it. You know, don't don't choose something you're not comfortable with or you feel like you're out of 
out of place, you know, leverage the areas that, that fit your unique skill sets and your personal preferences. That's where you're going to be able to stand tall naturally. So contrary to your com competitive thoughts, the best rainmakers, the top of the networking pyramid are connectors. And when they meet a person and talk to a person, their head's going, who would they like to meet? Who can help them? Who can they help? Blah, 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 blah. And the Rolodex is just moving in their minds. You know, they're just going down everything and putting people together. And the best thing that rainmakers do is they put people together. So one of the people who's in my book and who um, I think is one of the best rainmakers in the whole world is a co-managing partner of his firm. He's a litigator. He belongs to two networking groups and he brings in around a million dollars a month of new business. And I said to him, so when do you do your pitch? And he says, I don't do a pitch. I help people. And I say to them, if it's appropriate, you know, if you get into a jam and you need a litigator, give us a call, see if we can help. He said, that's all I do. I don't ask for anything back, but it comes back and it comes back tenfold. He has a connection for anything you need, anything in the world. He knows how to get it. He knows someone who knows someone who knows someone. So that's how he does it. And that's how they all do it. They all play it forward as aggressively as they can. They all are connectors and you know a connector because you go into a room and somebody has 20 people around them. That's the connector. That's a good tip. Yeah, I mean, and you want to you want to meet the connectors too, right? I mean, you as a networker, you want to be intentional with with introducing yourself with those influencers and connectors and and seeking an opportunity to help them. F find find a way to give them value, to show them value and do that consistently. So, this has been an incredible conversation, Carol. I'm I'm grateful for your time. Let's wrap up with a brief summary of the strategic networking process. So we've, we, we've covered a lot here, but if you can simply break down the blueprint as best you can, and, and just, you know, a few sentences here for listeners, if someone's wanting to really start tomorrow with the building an effective network in person or online, how would you guide them? Well, if they don't want to buy my book, what my book says is, there's five steps. The first step is what are your what are your top three goals? The second step is what is the outline of the plan that you have for how you want to reach those goals? And how much of that time that you're going to allow to reach them is going to include outreach, which is networking. The third thing is who's your target persona, as we call it in my world and yours? Who is it that is your ideal client? Then where do they go? And how do you find that out? You ask them, ask your clients. What do they read? What do they belong to? Who do they trust? And then follow those leaders, join those groups, get involved in those activities. And, and you know, some of it could also be your hobbies. If you're a kayaker, join a kayaking group. It doesn't have to be about law. It has to be something that you can contribute to and help people with. And can you help in that? Sure. Good old Charlie has a daughter who wants to learn to kayak. I'll take her because the father kayaks, but he's too worried about his daughter's safety to be any good at teaching her. You know, it's like teaching your kid to drive. Better you should have your uncle do it or your brother or somebody because you're going to be a mess. So you can do that. It doesn't matter. It just matters that it's relevant and it's you can be authentic there and you can do it. So that's step three. And then... You're going to do what we talked about. You're going to create tactics where you'll be seen as authentic, relevant, trustworthy, nice. Nice, that word we never apply to lawyers. But one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of them are really nice, really nice. And then, then you're going to develop, you're going to find ones you want to become really close to. And you're going to take the time to figure out tactics so that you can meet with them eight or ten times in a meaningful way. Not necessarily in person, but then you have a conversation about um, airplanes and you see an article in the, in the New York Times about airplanes, you send it to them with a note. This reminded me of what we were talking about on Tuesday. That's a connection. And you keep doing that so that over a year, you have eight to 10 touches, as you and I would call it in our worlds. But that means um, an interaction with them that's relevant, meaningful, 
trustworthy. And here we go again with the adjectives. And that's networking. And then it's called, you know, rinse and repeat. That's it. And stick with it. Stick with it consistently. You you mentioned your book, and for the listeners wanting to to check that out, you can find it on Amazon. I'm sure there are other places they can go purchase it, but it's called Strategic Networking for Introverts, Extroverts, and Everyone in Between. Again, Carol Shiro Greenwald. Carol, you've been amazing. Thank you so much. What, for those interested in reaching out to you or contacting you, what's the best way for them to do so? Either call me on the phone, 914-834-9320, or email me, carol at CSG. Those are my initials, marketing partners. That's the name of my firm, dot com. Blossom by ConsultWebs with Tanner Jones. For show notes, links, and info, go to consultwebs.com slash podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Watch for the next Blossom episode to discover more breakthrough insights to build a thriving law firm.